Hi, this is Alana, and this is Wait, How Do You Spell That?, a rare disease podcast produced by Patient Worthy. This episode was recorded in February at the NIH during Rare Disease Week. We talked to Harsha Raja Simha, the CEO and founder of Jiva Informatics Systems. Since recording this episode, Jiva Informatics has had some exciting updates. They've recently onboarded a couple key senior team members and signed up with KiwiTech as a strategic partner to help accelerate the development of their product. Today, we'll be talking about how restructuring clinical trials can impact the rare disease community in the United States and in India and across the world. We'll be providing links in our show notes if you'd like to learn more about the initiatives, and we hope you enjoy. Hi, this is Alana. Today we're at the NIH Rare Disease Day in Bethesda, Maryland, and I'm joined by a special guest. Can you, would you like to introduce yourself? Certainly. Thank you, Ileana. Um, my name is Harsha Rajasimha. I am the founder and uh, CEO of uh, Jiva Informatics Solutions. We are on a mission to decentralize clinical trials, reducing the travel burden for patients uh, in participating in clinical research. Um, you know, right now, almost all clinical trial participation happens in person mm-hmm. in the clinic. That adds a lot of burden on these rare disease patients yeah. who are already burdened and the families yes. as well. Uh, to travel every single time. So we, we think there is an opportunity to reduce the travel burden by anywhere from 20% up to 80% Wow! by replacing those travel visits with video conferencing calls and mobile devices and app engagement. Yeah, that's awesome. I do, like, I've definitely talked to a lot of patients where you have to drive 10 hours down and then 10 hours back. <laughs> yes. It's like, how do you stay in school or have a job or, like... Exactly. Um, Take care of uh, exactly your kids. Right. You know, typically uh, in the United States, ninety uh, percent of the trial participants tend to be within fifty miles mm-hmm. of where the clinical research sites are. So naturally, zip code has become an exclusion criteria yeah. for patients who live beyond the fifty mile radius uh-huh. of these sites, which is so unfair uh, yeah. for patients living. Uh, far from these uh, hot spots. Yeah, because it's unfair on multiple levels because it's like, first of all, if you have a disease that doesn't really have a treatment and your clinical trial is the best chance of getting a treatment, then you want to, I mean, it's obviously some people want to be in clinical trials, some people don't, but a lot of people do want the best chance they have at getting treated. But it's also, um, I know I've read a lot of stuff about how um, if you only have a certain type of person in a clinical trial, then all of the data skews to represent that sort of person. So it's like if it's one population that generally has this type of mutation, then it will be targeted towards that population. Absolutely. So uh, inclusion and diversity in mm-hmm. clinical research is such an important uh, aspect that FDA and NIH emphasize quite a bit. Mm-hmm. But it's uh, easier said than done. Uh, yeah. And we need to yeah. use and implement technologies that are already available mm-hmm. um, and in a way that fits within the preferences and lifestyle of patients and mm-hmm. their needs. Yeah. That, that, that's where we come in. Uh, these are not necessarily new devices or technologies, yeah. but we uh, deploy them in a way that me- uh, meets the patient requirements. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Sort of like looking at what patients are asking for, as opposed to I think a lot of clinical trials are these like top down things where exactly. the scientists are like, okay, so here's what we're thinking. Yeah. You know, it's, it's harder to get people to you know, take on a huge task because it's like a clinical trial can offer great things, but it also means that you are willing to give a lot of yourself, exactly. like physically and time-wise and yes. mentally yes. to these scientists who aren't always receptive to like how to make the process easier. Yes. How long has the startup been around? Yeah, we started uh, around uh, summer of 2018 uh, and cool. we went on a road trip uh, talking to customers, mm-hmm. uh, patient yes. advocacy groups and various stakeholders uh, listening to different perspectives. Um, Mm -hmm. We took all that, we got a grant from National Science Foundation and a few other grants from George Mason Mm -hmm. and CIT in Virginia and so on. Um, Used all that money to uh, understand what the unmet needs are, where the gaps Mm -hmm. are, uh, Mm -hmm. how the technology is being uh, Mm -hmm. inefficient. 
How so, did you collect the information? Did you like? Did you have a survey, or did you talk to people one on one? Yeah, good question. So the NSF uh, Innovation Core uh, model is uh, to collect the uh, information by talking to people face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to be close enough to the person that you are interviewing that you can see the pupil dilate, uh -huh. and, and when they have that aha moment, or if they have emphasize on something. Mm -hmm. So we we did these uh, discovery interviews with several hundred people face to face, occasionally on. Skype uh, or Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. but uh, mostly in person. Oh. Most of them were in person, and that gave us a great insight into what where the gaps are. Because mm -hmm. the, some of the tools do exist in in piecemeal, like electronic consent, which mm -hmm. uh, can help. Uh, but only less than two percent of all clinical trials are currently using e, e consent. Most of them still are paper based. Um, so the e consent. Could you uh, talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. You know, it's a process of explaining uh, the risks and benefits of, uh, for the patients to participate in a particular clinical study. And the patients make an informed decision whether mm. they want to enroll and opt in voluntarily into the clinical trial or mm -hmm. they do not want to opt in. And that's a process typically done in a clinic in person where a nurse or a physician mm -hmm. explains the uh, ben risk and benefits and answers any questions. And the patients have been signing a piece of paper, uh, you know, usually these informed consent forms can be 30, 50, 100 pages. Uh, so you, typically uh, patients do not read them. Yeah. Um, um, and some some do, but most don't. Mm -hmm. They would rather interact and ask questions than yeah. reading hundred pages uh, of fine print. So we want to simplify that process and um, uh, streamline that in a, a video conferencing mm -hmm. setting where patients can still do it as if it were face to face. But that's just uh, a starting point of getting patients uh, opted into the trial. Uh, but the real burden starts. From that point on, once uh, about 30% of patients who enroll in a study, on an average, drop out of the study before the trial ends, and that you know 25% of those dropouts can be attributed to the location of the site mm -hmm. or the um, number of visits involved, travel involved, and that's what we are trying to address. That's awesome. Where are you guys now? Like, have you guys um, started working on different trials um, or seeing results from it yet? Or Absolutely. Uh, we have received a lot of traction, both from the uh, patient advocacy groups are mm -hmm. giving extremely positive support letters and so on. Uh, but also the uh, uh, sponsors are very eager to uh, uh, try it out. Um, mm -hmm. And we have received venture capital investments, angel investments mm -hmm. and so on. So we are uh, moving from pilot, uh, prototype that we got uh, a lot of feedback from the customers uh, now into product development. Mm -hmm. And we are actively seeking pilot projects where we can mm -hmm. demonstrate uh, clinical validation of our technology. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. And also, uh, could you talk a little bit about your background and how you got into rare disease? I know you, uh, you also work with a nonprofit and you've been to Rare Disease Week. Uh, representing that before. That's right, Ileana. So I've been a rare advocate for about six years now. Mm -hmm. uh, founded the organization for Rare Diseases India mm -hmm. and Rare Diseases India USA in the past. Uh, last year, I kind of consolidated all the work I did in patient advocacy over the last six years and mm -hmm. founded the Indo-US organization for rare That's diseases. Cool. So I'm a U.S. citizen and mm -hmm. I live in Virginia, uh, close to the uh, FDA and the Senate. Mm -hmm. So we are uh, advocating for uh, with the Indian Congressional Caucus to um, engage India in clinical research in the mm -hmm. U.S., uh, connecting the sponsors, the clinical researchers, the patient advocacy groups with India having such a huge population mm -hmm. of over 1.3 billion. And we have an uh, Indian-American population of over 4 million. Um, by connecting these resources and stakeholders, uh, we can really accelerate the next generation of therapies much faster mm -hmm. because the United States has always been at the forefront of mm -hmm. making orphan drugs with the, since the Orphan Drug Act of 1983. Uh, over the last 35 years, we have made tremendous progress in the U.S. Um, countries like India and Asia and the uh, East in general, ex mm -hmm. with the exception of Japan, have largely been excluded from mm -hmm. participating in clinical trials in, in, in that 99 or 98 percent of trials uh -huh. happen outside of the Indian subcontinent. Mm -hmm. uh, largely, U.S. is the biggest funder of biomedical research in the world, mm -hmm. uh, including the industry. It's really big. 
however, the Indian diaspora offer a very rich genetic diversity, mm -hmm. which is not represented well in the uh, patients that are tested during the clinical trial process. And Indian uh, patients do not gain access to these treatments mm -hmm. um, uh, until uh, much later, yeah. maybe 15, 20 years down the road mm -hmm. when they become affordable, when they are off patent. And so there is a lot of these inequities uh, across mm -hmm. the globe. Uh, so that's that's what our nonprofit Indo US Rare uh, is advocating and trying to bridge those mm -hmm. and accelerate uh, mm -hmm. in a win win model uh, where the uh, American biotech uh, benefit by being able to find and recruit more patients faster, uh, and the Indian patients benefit by gaining access to these treatments during clinical trials, particularly in the cell and gene therapy space, where it's a one and done therapy. Uh, patients from India can travel, or, or anywhere mm -hmm. from in the world, can travel to a site located in another country, um, and they get the treatment. So once the clinical trial terminates or ends, it's not like they are no longer having access to the treatment because it was a one-time treatment. They yeah, got it. Yeah. So there is the uh, ethical question of um, not commercializing in a country after the clinical trial ends does not exist in cell and gene therapies in particular. Mm -hmm. But however, we would love to see um, uh, the biotech sponsors uh, making commitments to commercializing in low and middle income countries mm -hmm. such as India. Um, and if we can solve one country at a time, uh, solving India would uh, essentially mean a quarter of the world's population. Mm -hmm. If you combine that with the United States population of 330 million. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's a very impactful uh, uh, mission mm -hmm. to bridge US and India and make this a win-win partnership mm -hmm. and collaboration. Yeah, that makes sense. Especially, I think, in the rare space, one of the things that you hear is that uh, clinical trial recruiting you know, it's hard because there aren't that many patients to begin with, like by virtue of being a rare disease. But yeah. it's also it's like if you expand to other countries, right. suddenly you have more people right. to start figuring out how to treat yes. people in the U.S. as well. Exactly. And that's a natural evolution over the last six years of mm -hmm. being in the U.S. and attending these conferences mm -hmm. and meeting yeah. patient advocacy groups. It's a question that I have been asked very frequently. Mm -hmm. uh, you have such a, a huge population in India. There should be. Uh, uh, at least a thousand or a few thousand patients yeah. with uh, ultra rare diseases even. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are not easy to find. They mm -hmm. have to go through some genetic testing and other biomarker screening. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of screen failures everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we are come to a point where the uh, biotech sponsors are competing for patients for a given disease to recruit into clinical mm -hmm. trial where there's numerous clinical trials trying to uh, recruit patients with SMA, mm -hmm. muscular dystrophy, and mm -hmm. uh, lysosomal storage diseases. Um, so we, we have to go beyond the US and European sites. Yeah, yeah. no, that, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, how did you get into rare disease advocacy? So I, in 2012, I, I am a genomics data scientist by training, mm -hmm. um, and I have published over 15 articles. Wow. Uh, I went, uh, my master's and PhD was at Virginia Tech. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent a number of years um, working on genome sequencing data analysis uh, in, at NIH, uh, mm -hmm. Cancer Institute, IE Institute. Um, and uh, one of the earliest rare disease projects I worked on uh, as a scientist were analyzing the coronavirus and several oh, other wow. rare viral disease genomes and mm -hmm. host pathogen interaction type projects, but also on rare retinal and neurodegenerative diseases. Um, mm -hmm. But until I had a personal experience in 2012, um, we had a baby born with mm -hmm. uh, Edwards syndrome or trisomy mm -hmm. 18, mm -hmm. um, and the baby passed away from the NICU. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, that uh, really changed my perspective of having been involved in rare yeah. disease research more as a data scientist level, uh, not really interacting with the patients, but now uh, being part of a family uh, affected by that. Uh, what if the baby had survived with a lot of special needs? And that's what uh, mm -hmm. rare parents go through. Their, their um, whole life changes, their career suffers and socioeconomic issues. Mm -hmm. So my eyes were open to that side of things and when I look back at what I could be doing mm -hmm. uh, in my own capacity as a volunteer, um, became an advocate uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know been uh, fortunate to have met very uh, inspiring people uh, mm -hmm. along the journey. That is really inspiring. 
something that probably anybody who's listened to more than one episode of the podcast is like tired of hearing me say um, is uh, when we've been interviewing people there have been such different stories but one common thread is if someone was a school teacher before they use those skills to advocate for the rare disease community if someone was a diplomat they like get really involved in the political side right. and you can sort of see how it lines up with someone's recognizing what skills they have to offer yes. and figuring out how to implement them. That, you are absolutely right. And that's what drove me into be, becoming a full-time entrepreneur and mm -hmm. uh, founded Jiva Informatics to apply my data art, data science um, and also digital health uh, mm -hmm. skills uh, to bring uh, clinical trials to patients where they live. And I think uh, eventually this is going to be global. And yeah. so uh, this digital engagement is much necessary. Um, to uh, you know, we can't always keep flying patients from yeah. different countries uh, un unless it's really absolutely required. Mm -hmm. um, especially with the cell and gene therapies, uh, FDA has now mandated that mm -hmm. they have to. Uh, the sponsors are uh, required to uh, collect safety data because mm -hmm. uh, the long-term safety or adverse events of these viral vector-based uh, gene therapies are yet unknown. Mm -hmm. So up to 15 years of safety monitoring is required mm -hmm. um, for um, many of the lentiviral vector-based yeah. um, gene therapies. And so that's where the uh, use of AI and digital health uh, plays a role, and that's what we are building. Um, you've also you've worked in this space for a few years. Have you seen it change a lot? Oh, it's evolved enormously. Even just looking at the NIH Rare Disease Day, one of my yeah. f uh, favorite events uh, where, you know, when I started coming, there were maybe 100 to 150. Um, and, and today, uh, mm -hmm. I think... What year was that? That was uh, 20... Uh, when, when did Rare Disease Day start to oh, uh, be sure. celebrated? Maybe four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, w I was working at NIH when, when I, ha I had this experience in 2012 and uh, I connected with the Office of Rare Disease Research back mm -hmm. then. So sometime around 2013, 2014, I think, is when I mm -hmm. first attended. Um, and today, there's like several hundred. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's grown so big. Uh, and the community is growing. A mm -hmm. lot of new faces now. Uh, for first few years, it was the same faces mostly. Mm -hmm. Today, I'm meeting so many new people here uh, with new stories. And mm -hmm. this community is growing in strength. Yeah. Even the rare disease legislative advocates, uh, you know, advocating at the Senate and Congress, mm -hmm. uh, that community has been gaining so much of strength and momentum. Really good yeah. to be part of this. Yeah, no, it's great. And I'm glad that you are part of it. <laughs> um, before I let you go, um, I have two last questions, which is one, where can people uh, find your work, um, like social media handles, websites, people who want to get involved or learn more. And the other is if you have uh, last words to share with anybody listening, um, who is in the rare disease community or is interested in the rare disease community, uh, what would you leave them with? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so you can find me on um, uh, all the social media channels uh, at either my personal identifiers, which is Harsha Raja Simha, mm -hmm. uh, H-A-R-S-H-A-R-A-J-A-S-I-M-H-A. Mm -hmm. uh, you will find uh, my personal story as well as uh, my work in both the nonprofit realm and my startup. Uh, if you like to get more information about the decentralized clinical trials uh, startup, uh, you can go to jivatrials.com. It's J E E V A T R I A L S dot com. Um, and you can find it the same handle on Twitter, Facebook, mm -hmm. and LinkedIn as well. They are easy to find. Mm -hmm. And uh, the key message I would say is, uh, I think now more than ever, um, there is a need to uh, deploy technology in a way that um, are assisting patients and uh, fitting within the patient preferences and their lifestyle and their needs. Patients should not be expected to fit in trials. Mm -hmm. The trials should be fitting in the uh, preferences and lifestyle of patients and mm -hmm. caregivers. And uh, with the FDA's patient-focused drug development and patient listening sessions, the, uh, the largest regulatory agency in the world is driving this patient-centricity and patient-focused aspects mm -hmm. and encouraging the sponsors 
uh, and all the stakeholders involved in clinical research to truly design protocols in a manner that fits within the patient's lives. Mm -hmm. So that uh, I think that's very encouraging and that's why I have uh, founded this company because this is the right time, mm -hmm. in the right place um, and we hope that uh, the stakeholders will adopt and use the technology in a way that reduces the burden on patients mm -hmm. and uh, accelerate more therapies faster. Thank you so much. Thanks for being on our podcast. This was great learning about your company and it's really cool. Thank you so much, Ileana. <laughs> it was an honor and pleasure being here. Thanks.